Hi, welcome to the Texas Association of Builders Zoom at noon. Today you will be hearing from Dr. Jim Gaines as he discusses the 2022 housing forecast. But first, let's hear a message from our sponsor, Great American Insurance Group. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Tomlinson, Divisional Assistant Vice President for Great American Insurance Group's Property and Inland Marine Division, where I oversee the United States and Canadian residential construction teams. We proudly specialize in providing the insurance coverage that is unique to the home building industry. With more than 150 years of experience, you can trust that we have you covered so you can focus on bringing dream homes to life for your customers. 2021 was another challenging year for our nation. The coronavirus pandemic was ongoing, building materials and labor were in high demand, and costs continued to climb. These factors all contributed to uncertainty in the markets and the home building industry. We're fortunate to again have Jim Gaines, one of the nation's most respected housing economists, bring us his housing forecast for 2022. Dr. Gaines focuses on housing and land development issues. He has more than 35 years of experience in a broad array of professional real estate activities and has provided consulting services to numerous businesses, institutions, developers, and all levels of government organizations. He served as president of Rice Center, an urban research center affiliated with Rice University, and was an associate professor at the University of South Carolina. After retiring from the Texas Real Estate Research Center in 2020, Dr. Gaines rejoined the staff in 2021. His new role is a slimmed down version of his position as chief economist, which he held for five years. Dr. Gaines continues making presentations, reviewing manuscripts, and giving media interviews. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Gaines. Thank you, Great American Insurance Group. Before Dr. Gaines begins his presentation, he did save a few minutes at the end of his webinar to answer a few questions from the audience. Now, Dr. Gaines, whenever you're ready, if you want to start sharing your screen and go ahead and take it away. I do have to unmute. You, you, you know, you have to deal with all of the technological stuff. I brought it up to screen share and then I had to unmute. Can you see it? I can see it. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard. Uh, probably the first thing I should mention to you is that uh, all of the forecasts and all of the, all of the projections that I might give you here in the, in the next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so, are now subject to to being completely wrong because <laughs> we are because of the uh, invasion of the Ukraine and all of the uncertainty that's being created. Now I thought I'd address first because I know we're we're getting I've been getting the question here for the last uh, several days. Several reporters have called and, and called our offices and said, "Okay, tell us what it all means and, and so on." And the bottom line is, we don't really know. Uh, there, there isn't an economist in the world, and I've been trying to keep pace with whatever all of the other economists around the country are, are saying and, and, and thinking and what are, are the impact of all of this may be. And the, and the bottom line is it obviously depends on how long it lasts, how, how deep it gets, how expansionary it might be. And I'm talking about the, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, and all of this on top of the fact that we were we were just beginning, we were really, truly just getting over all of the pandemic effect. I mean, we know the last two years, and, it, and incidentally, if you're not aware of it, this month marks exactly two years because it was March of 2020 uh, when all of the COVID started hitting and everybody started talking about it and so forth. And, and so here we are two years later really just recovering or, or getting, getting back to some semblance uh, of a normal economy and normal lifestyle uh, that we, we experienced from the pandemic. So we'll have to just see how it goes. Uh, okay. How's that? Uh, and, and we're going to just have to see how it's going to go here. And next, so so all the 
I was listening to one other economist yesterday, <laughs> and the, the only thing he said that I really and truly agreed with, he says, I really don't know how to forecast anything right now. I have no idea uh, of how well or how badly all of this is going to go, and, and we'll have to see. But we can see some, uh, some obvious things. We've got the fiscal stimulus, basically the fiscal stimulus packages and so forth are over. Uh, those in, encouraged uh, some spending. Uh, it, it was interesting that the, the amount of stimulus that was poured into the economy by the federal government, which totaled more than $4 trillion, uh, really didn't stimulate the economy to the level that they thought it would be, that they thought it would. And, and part of that is because it didn't really get out in circulation It went to use it paid off bills and so forth also built up a lot of savings and so forth, uh, which really is now coming back in a circular kind of pattern back for the home builders and the home housing market that people have saved up and have a down payment. Uh, employment and income gains are still going on I, I i'll give you some graphics on that and some data, uh, but it's still a little sluggish. Uh, obviously, just this morning, everybody is revising down their expectations for for the first quarter of this year. Uh, now that the impact, or or it's beginning the impact of the of the Ukrainian issue, so we'll have to wait and see uh, how that goes. Uh, major supply chain uh, interruption. Uh, you guys uh, in the home building industry. And many of you in the services industries, in the secondary and, and service uh, companies that serve the home builders, know just as well uh, the restrictions and limitations of, of the supply chain of getting things, goods and services. Even the services sector, the ISM index came out here uh, yesterday or this morning. It was down over three and a half points uh, because the service sector, which you don't normally associate with the goods being in, in uh, the supply chain issue, but they're 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 hurting as well. We do know the Fed is going to increase interest rates. I know you all are waiting for that. That's a that's one of my fearless forecasts. Uh, the only issue is is by how much and when. We my my original forecast was to tell you that I think the Fed is going to increase the the Fed's fund rate by a quarter of a point, twenty five basis points here the end of this month. I think it's around the 21st or 22nd of this month whenever the uh, open market committee meets. However, uh, now the, 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 revision, the revised uh, theory on this is that it could well be that uh, the inflation that's being induced by the, by the war, uh, the, the inflation that's being induced from all other sectors, uh, it may well be that it could be a half a point increase this first go round. It, that, so we know it's going to happen. Uh, and in fact, you can, if you've been watching most of the, the capital, the capital markets and the stock market and so forth the last several days, it's already being capitalized in. Uh, what's being recapitalized is the notion that it might be uh, more than the 25 basis point, that it could be as much as 50 basis points. And also the, the expectations, if you will, uh, that by the end of this calendar year, the, the Fed funds rate will probably have increased maybe more about a 1.25 to one and a half percentage points uh, above what it was here at the beginning of the year. We started the year at effect effectively zero or 0.25 in their range, and it could wind up at the end of the year could be as high as uh, one and a half percent. And that will filter through uh, and affect longer term rates the 10 year treasury, the 30 year uh, uh, rate and the 30 year mortgage rates, which, of course, is going to be of, in, of great importance uh, here in the in the housing market. Inflationary pressures are going to push costs up in addition to the supply chain issues, in addition to the high demand for uh, item for goods and services, uh, as well as the limited inventory that's occurring across the board. Uh, in all manner of industries and all manner of activities. This also increases the yield requirements uh, and cap rates, if you will, for, for commercial real estate, for investment real estate. And that is going to have a big uh, impact on asset prices, which as we all know for the last several years have been going up uh, tremendously. Well, let me give you some numbers. Uh, 
Here's what quarterly annualized percent change in real GDP has looked like for the last several years. Uh, you can see the projection for the first quarter of this year has recently been reduced. We, we're looking for maybe something on the order of around 2%. Might be a little better than that. January was a pretty good month. February was not bad. March, of course, is going to is taking a big hit here uh, with the Ukrainian issue and brought the forecast down. Uh, it's also probably true that the forecast for the whole year, the 3.6 to 4 percent, I, I hedge my bets. Instead of trying to, to give a single number for uh, GDP growth, I'll give you what I think is the best range uh, I can. And I think right now that the general wisdom is uh, that the 3.6 three, six, three, six to 4 percent probably needs to be reduced by about a point to maybe two point, uh, a percentage point. Uh, tenths of a percentage point, maybe three, four to three, eight, something like that uh, to, for the year. That's that's uh, and it could be even worse. It, it could be maybe something like two and a half to three and a half. Again, we're all shooting in the dark right now, trying to figure out uh, what what is going to happen with the Ukrainian issue and just exactly how extensive uh, the economic hits are, are going to be. I guess maybe if we take all of these yachts and stuff that we're trying to confiscate and throw them into the economy somehow, we could boost it back up. But I don't think that's going to. I don't think that's going to help. Obviously, everything is still dependent on the COVID. We're not really completely out of the pandemic yet. And and here's the latest graph that I I brought out from the CDC and 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 sort of to give the time frame here. When the original uh, impact of, of the COVID-19 hit, uh, you can see the number of cases and the seven day moving average on the number of cases. Then we had a real downturn. We thought we were pretty much out of it by the first half of, the, of last year in 2021. And then all of a sudden we got hit with this Delta variant. And it was, it was uh, pretty impressive, a pretty hit. And then we started coming out of Delta. Well, then, of course, we got the Omicron, and it's been the worst of the three in terms of the cases. But the good news is it does appear that it was short lived uh, in terms of the variant having the kind of impact on the number of cases and, and following to, of course, number of hospitalizations, number of deaths. So getting that back down and it was interesting that our recovery, we were starting the recovery as the Delta variant was declining. And when the Omicron hit, the economy did not feel the same kind of negative impact that it had prior to from Delta and from the original uh, pandemic effect. So the good news is that it looks like we're coming back down, getting down into the region of being able to say, hey, maybe we're through it. Uh, although if you've been reading the, the news uh, here lately, the, the uh, health experts appear to be anticipating there's going to be yet another variant that's going to show up, another mutant form of the COVID. But, but the anticipation is that we'll be better able to handle it on, from a health basis uh, through immunization, for, from uh, vaccines, from uh, medicines that are being developed and so forth and simply knowing what to do and how to react to it. And, and so the anticipation is that while there may be another variant to come along, it won't have the same kind of impact uh, that we felt before from the others. Let me get to, here's, here's what recovery looks like at the national level. We're not quite there yet through January. Don't have the February numbers yet. It's still early in the game for that. But through the uh, end of January, we're still about just shy of 3 million jobs, uh, shy of being where we were in February of 2020, which kind of what is being used and, and called recovery, if you will. Uh, it's about 2%, and we'll have to just see how that goes. Headline unemployment is back down to 4%, so the Fed is right now obviously more focused on inflation than it is on unemployment. It has the dual mandate of full employment, low inflation. Well, they've got the employment back down uh, to a reasonable 4%. And for those of you who are my age, and we went to college back in the 60s and 70s, uh, heck, we thought 6% was full employment. So <laughs> we're, we're in good shape. In fact, uh, as you well know, we actually have 
far more jobs available than we do people unemployed, technically. We've got just shy of 11 million jobs available in the economy right now, and about six and a half million people unemployed on the official statistics. The, the unofficial statistics or the, the more extreme probably puts that six and a half uh, closer to eight, between eight and eight and a half million, but that's, uh, uh, you know, matter of data co computations and manipulation and so forth. The point being uh, that we're, for, we're facing an interesting uh, paradox in our economy of people unemployed and jobs going unfilled. And you would think that, uh, that coming out of the pandemic, we would be doing better. Uh, all of us are aware uh, that, that the hotels, the motels, the restaurants and others having real trouble. And of course, it is also equally true in the construction industry. There's several hundred thousand uh, construction jobs available around the country. And this is both residential and non-residential construction, uh, public sector construction. Uh, we're welders and, and plumbers and masons, carpenters, uh, you name it. And there's a shortage of that labor force uh, and employees. And that's one of the things that's affecting our housing market and the, and the residential construction market uh, very, very high. Inflation, we've mentioned it now a couple of three times. Here's what it looks like. I've traced it back back to 2008, back just as the beginning of the Great Recession, back in the 2008, 2009, and I would argue even through 2010 period. Officially, it ended in June 2009, but most of us would probably agree that effectively that recession went through 2010 as well. And you can see what inflation did. And in fact, uh, the big dip there in that orange line is the thing that, that, that uh, most economists and the Fed and other government officials are most scared of. That's depression. That's uh, when you have depression in, uh, and deflation instead of inflation, uh, when prices actually decline and capital asset prices decline and goods and services prices decline, uh, that's a very tough spiral to get out of. And, and it is a very difficult position uh, to be. That was in essence what happened in the 1930s. That's why you call it a depression. It's, it's deflation is what it is, but prices are depressed and go that way. And you can see it took a while to get out of it. Even back in uh, to June of in 15, in, the, in 2015, we had negative inflation or negative CPI growth. Now core CPI, stayed positive that whole time. Core CPI, of course, is the total CPI minus energy and food, which is, is an arguable kind of position. But the, the argument there is those are so volatile that we would rather see the, st see the more stable price index and see what stable prices, uh, more stable prices look like. And that's the difference between core, the blue line and the orange line. Getting up to seven and a half percent, that's the biggest we've had since back in 1979, 1980. Many of you will remember that period of time when interest rates also followed suit from the inflation. Uh, uh, prime rates went up over 20 percent, 21 percent. Mortgage interest rates went up to 18 to 19 percent. And and everything was a real issue. So we'll talk about interest rates right now. We're still looking pretty good. The uh, federal funds rate, that's the green line there. That's the one that I was talking about earlier. The Fed will meet here in late March, and that rate will probably start uh, ratcheting up much like it did back in 2016, 17. It'll probably go up steeper than that, that increase. It'll go up faster. Uh, it'll go uh, and come back up to about that one and a half level, maybe, uh, where the current uh, blue line is just above that. The blue line is the 10 year treasury. That's sort of our benchmark uh, medium term or lo longer term interest rate mark. And you'll find that mortgage interest rates tend to follow that 10 year treasury pretty close, uh, about 170 basis points uh, above the 10 year treasury. And you'll, you'll, you'll get the 30 year fixed mortgage rate. That's the Fannie Mae rate, uh, uh, the Freddie Mac rate that's reported every week. Uh, out there. Incidentally, these are monthly rates I'm showing on the on the uh, chart. And I'm well aware 
that obviously daily and weekly, these rates jump all over the place. In fact, I was just uh, in Houston uh, less than a week ago with some mortgage uh, 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 professionals, and they were telling me, at least in the Houston market, they were already quoting uh, 30 year rates over 4% at four and a quarter percent. So uh, I don't be surprised that uh, these, these look a little bit low, probably compared to what you've just been told in the last few days for those of you who are in the business. And I'm well aware of that, but, but we track it on a monthly basis to try to get it even out a little bit and have an idea of what's going on. Well, that's the national economy. Let me, let me talk a little bit about Texas. We know that Texas got hit with the double whammy. In, in uh, December of 2019, Saudi Arabia, Russia decided to have a price war on oil and let the price go where it will. They, they increased their production levels, the price of oil fell, and that, of course, does get felt back here in Texas when those guys over there decide to do something. The price of oil is a global price and is set at a global market basis. And so there's we, while we are a major producer, uh, Texas, if you're not aware of it, Texas produces about 40 percent of all the U.S. production and the U.S. production is number one in the world. We took over that number one position in 2018 as a result of all the uh, growth in the fracking. Uh, industry and we we supplanted uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia uh, as being the leading producers. Uh, we are now number one, Saudi number two, and Russia number three. That's that's of course the big impact of the war, and I was going to comment on that when we get to it in a little bit uh, more. Then of course, just as we got hit with the with the oil price increase in the early part of 2020 in January and February. Then in March of 2020, we got hit with the coronavirus, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, that affected the economy even more, and we, we went uh, uh, accordingly. Here's where we are. Everything really has been hinged up until two weeks ago, or maybe a month ago, when we kind of anticipated the invasion. But until then, Everything was really dependent on COVID control. We had to get the pandemic under control and get things back into some semblance of normal economic activity without closures, without uh, uh, space restrictions, without schools being impacted, without hotels and, and restaurants and air traffic and everything else being affected by lack of travel and lack of movement. But here's here's what's going on. Job recovery in Texas has been achieved. Uh, I'm going to show you in just a minute. Our growth has been a little sluggish here lately, but we, we have actually totally re recovered. Our consumer attitudes and spending has picked up in the state. Uh, uh, activity has picked up. Retail sales have picked up. Uh, hotels, hotels and modals are doing better. What one of the th interesting things in Texas is, of course, we've always been an entrepreneurial state. We've been looking for the entrepreneurism to come back and come in. Energy is going to be a questionable driver. I, 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 until the war happened here, we thought that energy would be neutral. It probably will now be positive, but probably not to the same level. Housing is going to continue strong. I'm going to show you more about that. State and local budgets are, are going to be pushed and, and so forth. Retail, uh, property tax based budgeting is still in pretty good shape because property values have been just going up, both commercial and residential. So the, the property tax base is held up. Sales tax revenues, of course, for the state, where the state gets its majority of its revenue, have been, have been problematic. And of course, we're growing in population. We, we haven't stopped at all. Let me, let me keep going here a little faster. Here's what it looks like. Same pattern in terms of the Omicron being a, a spike in the cases and the impact on a short-term basis, but it does look like uh, this is through uh, last last week or the week before. Uh, it does look like that it is trending down, and we, we we need to get that down close to that zero line. Get it down to the bottom as fast as we can, and see what we can do with that if we can. Uh, the 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 employment level. I may I'm going to show you two graphs that are going to look identical. This first graph is the number of people working. This is based on the uh, population survey of just calling people up. They do a survey and say, "Are you? Do you have a job? Are you working?" Uh, and so forth. And 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 November of 2021, we finally exceeded where we were back in February of 20. 
And that's, that's a good thing. That means that's full recovery. And you can see through December, through year end, that we were indeed uh, above the February 20 uh, level. And if you imagine that blue line extending on out, if, if we hadn't had the orange, if we hadn't had the pandemic and had the big dip there with the orange line uh, of how that was trending forward, we're looking forward to get back on that trend, that general trend line. Same thing with the number of jobs. In November 21, we finally exceeded the February 20 number. Uh, end of the year, more jobs uh, uh, there than, than uh, when we had before. So it took us, effectively, it took about almost two years uh, to incur the, the downturn of the pandemic and get ourselves back into shape. In terms of a forecast or a look forward, and again, now take this one with a little bit of grain of salt because we don't know how the rest of this year is really going to pan out for Texas. Uh, but we were expecting somewhere around a 3% growth rate. Uh, the 2021 numbers are not completely final. That's the reason I, I'm showing them still as a green bar with a more or less of approximately 400, 441,000 jobs added. Uh, we think 2022 was going to slow down anyway because of interest rates was gonna constrain business. Now, though, we're going to get the impact on the energy sector, probably going to get some energy jobs created, and we'll have to see how that goes. But this looks like a very reasonable type of projection and gets us close to being back online with the general trend that we've had the last 10 years or more uh, since about 2011, when we actually came out of the Great Recession and started moving ahead. On the energy front, you can see the price of oil, the orange line there has well, these are weekly prices, average weekly prices, uh, well up close to $95. I was just looking this morning, today's price I think was 103. Uh, so it is gonna get over $100 a barrel. Uh, we haven't had that for quite some time. We did see it. Uh, I don't have the graph far enough back to show it the last time it happened. I think it was 2014. Uh, and you'll see the rig count there, the blue line, it's, climb, it's climbing up, it's the general upward trend, but it's not that steep. Uh, we, we are better at drilling more efficient, more productive wells, so we don't have to drill as many. Also, because of the technology, te technological changes in the fracking industry and in the drilling activity, we don't create as many new jobs uh, as we have used to in the drilling. Uh, there's also the uncertainty of just how long this is going to happen. If, uh, if the Russian oil goes off the market, it's, it's, it's a very big impact. It's 17% of total world production. Uh, that, that, will, that is going to make oil prices jump uh, completely. So don't be surprised if we go up not only to $100 a barrel oil, but even more than that sometime during the course of this year. The issue is going to be, is it going to stay there? And how long will it stay there? And how deep will that, that uh, be affected uh, in, in, the, uh, in the overall scheme of things? As I understand it, we're now gonna have a moratorium on importing Russian oil. We do import oil from Russia. Uh, we won't do that anymore, uh, at least for the time being. And, and again, that's another one of those issues of just what it's going to have, what kind of total impact that's going to have on our economy. Let me talk about demographics, because in real estate and all of you in the housing sector, uh, people and jobs. If you, if you figure out people and jobs, <laughs> you can pretty much figure out what's going to happen in housing. Uh, everybody's got to be somewhere which that's the people, that's the nominal demand, and then the income that you people get from their jobs makes it an effective demand of what they can afford to pay for and how much they can pay for it and when. So we're still adding population. Texas has done extremely well. The 2020 census came out, but most of you are probably not aware it was not a universal increase statewide. 143 counties out of our 254 counties in the state actually lost population in the last 10 years. But we had such population gain in particularly the Eastern East Texas urban triangle, the Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, Austin, the I-45, I-10, I-35 triangle. And you can see the, the, the uh, 
uh, what, what appear, at least on my screen, green and blue counties are the, are the high growth counties. Uh, interesting, uh, Dallas County was not, but that's because everybody was moving to Denton and Collin and the surrounding counties. Uh, even Harris County uh, total uh, uh, was, was somewhat up. Uh, well, actually, it was not. You'll see in the next slide. I've got the best counties here next for you. But, but Texas was the fastest growing state. According to the 2020 census, we grew by 3,999,946 people. That's the official number. Now, all they had to do was go around in some of our communities and count some of the people living under bridges, and I'm sure they'd have found another 54 people and called it an even 4 million. But nevertheless, didn't happen, so we'll have to see what, what goes from there. If we look around the state, uh, uh, Harris County, uh, the largest county uh, in, uh, in the state, second uh, in terms of uh, population change and total population change, that prior graph was percent. So this in terms of percent, uh, in terms of total number of people, Harris County was very fast, Bayer, Tarrant, Collin, Travis, Dallas, all of the counties adding uh, tremendous numbers of people. Uh, most of it, great many of it, most of it from the natural change, that's births over deaths. Uh, as an older person, I'm glad to say that, but, but more, not as many people are dying. Uh, international migration, what you'll see there is uh, particularly Dallas and Harris County uh, growing tremendously from international uh, migration, much more so than, than domestic migration. That's, that's coming from uh, outside the state uh, or outside, even outside the county, uh, which we know that uh, a lot of people that have been living in the high density counties have been moving to the lower density counties. So we just have to see how that goes. In terms of household tenure, owner versus renter, and then projected out to 2050, you can see how the projections go. Uh, that that uh, you you know we're looking at at doubling from 2010 out to 2050, roughly doubling the number of of households and housing units. That means the housing units that are going to be needed are going to more or less have to be doubled, both renter multi-family renter and single family renter and own home ownership. Uh, so we'll have to see. If we look at the, uh, the uh, COG, uh, the Council of Government uh, regions, and this was their projections, uh, it's interesting, this is just out to the year 2030. So this is just the rest of this decade. Uh, they are predicting you know, numeric changes in the number of households, now from the 2014, 2018 time period. So it's a little more than the 10 years, but in Dallas, Fort Worth, over uh, almost over 870,000 households. In Houston, over 887,000 households. In Austin, almost three, uh, 350,000. These are households. That means there that many housing units need to be produced and built in the time period here out to the year 2030. So my, my word to you as members of the uh, uh, Builders Association is, you've got your work cut out for you. It's coming and, and we'll have to see just how it goes. Housing markets, let me, let me get to that and, and uh, take a few minutes and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions if you have them. And I know I'm going fast, I just, there's a lot to say. And I'm probably leaving some stuff out that I should be saying and haven't said it yet. But what we all know is that the demand uh, greatly still exceeds the supply. Uh, this is pretty much true throughout, especially our major metropolitan areas. Now, some of those counties that were in red and orange back there, over there a minute ago that lost population uh, don't are not facing the same type of disparity or imbalance in the market between the supply and the demand. And so there in a lot of those counties, the uh, the pricing the price increases haven't been as dramatic, but in our in our major counties and our major MSAs, uh, it, it, the the imbalance is pronounced. Uh, I'm going to show you here in just a minute, and it's it's led to just almost phenomenal, really un, unwanted uh, home price increases uh, over the last year or so. You can see, and, and this is our repeat sales home price index from the Real Estate Research Center. This is, uh, this is the parallel index or numbers measured the same way that the, the Case-Shiller, uh, CoreLogic Case-Shiller index 
that you're familiar with, the FHFA index, uh, the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae put out an index similar to this. It's based on the same house reselling rather than just the average sales or the median prices in a period of time. But these are based on uh, tracking the same house over time. And if it sells, computing the implied annual percent of, of increase in, or decrease in the price from the first sale to the second sale to the third sale. So I hope that makes some sense to you. And this is converted to a year over year percent change basis and annual rate of increase basis. And you can see Austin, that's the orange line there. I had to, I had to put orange in, in for Austin, of course. Uh, Austin has been just out of sight. It, it, when you get up over 40%, uh, uh, year over year increase in, in price levels, uh, unsustainable, uh, undesirable, quite frankly. Uh, it, it creates real havoc in the marketplace. And you can see how fast, how rapidly uh, that happened between 2020, right after the dip, which was when we lost all those jobs back on the job chart. You can see the dip there in early 2020. But since then, with a little bit of dip there for the Delta variant, it, it has taken off. Uh, the, the Omicron is probably responsible for some of the decline uh, there, at just or just the fact that the market was not going to keep going on an on a upward trajectory uh, that you see there. And then you can see how Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, Houston has been a little bit the slowest because Houston got hit the hardest with the double whammy on the oil, oil and energy uh, changes from the Saudi Russian uh, price war uh, relative to the other metro areas, which really were not affected hardly at all uh, to see anything. But you can still see how getting up close to 20 percent uh, and up to even 15 percent for Houston, those are extremely high rates of increase for for property for housing. Uh, it, normal is is somewhere four to six percent at, at best. Uh, uh, say call it five if you want to, and you can see historically back through the decade that that was what it was running at. Uh, but so you can tell that that's a real problem. And here's the real, here's the culprit that the month's inventory. This is our measure of demand relative to supply, and you can see how. Back in 2011, we were up seven, eight, nine months of supply. That's that's even uh, above norm. Norm is call it six six months uh, for major metropolitan markets like the ones that we have here in in, in Texas. Uh, generally, I, I'll call it five to seven months and call it six just for a benchmark uh, for what would be considered a balanced uh, market where there's adequate supply, adequate demand and they tend to balance out. But you can see we're running down close to, you know, one month, less than one and a half months. Uh, that's an extremely tight market, uh, a real seller's market. Some of this is statistics. Uh, a lot of times homes get listed for sale and they're sold even before they get put into the system or they enter the system as pending sales and so forth. So, so there's a, a just-in-time inventory uh, aspect to what is going on in the in the Texas housing market and in the housing markets across uh, all of our metropolitan areas. One of the others uh, is new home months of inventory, and I know you'd be interested in that. And you can see that's beginning to come up uh, that some of this is is a little bit of a slack off in the demand, but it's also because the last two years, uh, the home builders in the state of Texas have been building houses uh, as you well know, Texas is the number one home building state in the union, which probably makes it pretty close to the number one <laughs> home building state of a lot of countries. And incidentally, uh, Dallas and Houston have been the number one and two, and it, it's been, it bounces back and forth, uh, metropolitan areas in the United States for new home construction, uh, new single family home construction, particularly. But also, if you throw in the multifamily, we're there. I think only New York, uh, because of all the apartments that got built there, uh, even, even challenges uh, at all. But you can see how we had the dip uh, uh, from the Delta and the Omicron, and it's now coming back up somewhat. Uh, the other thing that we do. 
we look at is home sales price to the list price ratio. This is another indicator of how tight markets get. Uh, all of you I know have heard in anecdotally, and many of you maybe have even experienced the, the, uh, with some of your uh, spec homes, that you're actually able to, to sell the house and get uh, buyers to bid and, and bid the price up higher than the listing price. Normal normal ratio here is about, and it varies uh, from market to market, as you can see, but they, you, you'll see they, they run pretty tight uh, until recently. But somewhere around 95% is a, is a good number uh, uh, that most of the time, the final closing price will be about 95% of the listing price uh, for, for, and this is pretty much true for new and existing. Uh, newer homes get, get separated out. And when I say new homes, the, we get data on new homes that are sold by the realtors through the multiple listing services. So we use that to monitor or, or to estimate or, or measure what is going on in the new home market. Well, obviously that's not the new home market in total. In fact, best guess is it, it might be 20%, uh, maybe as high as 25, but probably more like 20% or a little less of the total market because we don't get the custom, we don't get the direct contracts, we don't get the uh, home sales from the from the big builders, the Pultys, the uh, uh, Dr. Hortons, and, and others, uh, KB Homes, uh, because a lot of times they use their own sales force and, and do their own marketing, so they don't use the realtors uh, nearly to the extent uh, and in, in other areas. But nevertheless, we 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 have this, and what you can see is. That again, Austin had been off the charts. Uh, people were paying as much as eight to ten percent. These are just averages that we we had anecdotal reports of you know homes being sold for 20, 30 percent higher than the listing price. Not all homes, uh, but some of them, and enough to bring the average uh, home sale price to list price ratio up. Uh, and and incidentally, we report all this in our monthly housing reports, so you can go and follow this later. You don't need me to come online uh, every month. Mortgage applications, this is a, a good indicator of where things are going and the anticipation of more, higher mortgage rates. Uh, as the rates have been creeping up here the last uh, several months, in the last year actually, you can see the refi, the, the number of uh, loans being uh, uh, mortgage applications for refinancing have been falling. That'll fall even more dramatically here in the coming months. Uh, as, as we're anticipating uh, that mortgage interest rate to start approaching uh, the 4% level uh, by the end of the year, just across the board generally, might probably in some of the markets, it'll go above the four, as I mentioned Houston a minute ago. Uh, the purchase mortgage uh, index, the blue line across the bottom has been fairly consistent. Uh, we're anticipating or expect that uh, a lot of uh, future demand is being pulled into the current as people are now getting nervous about higher prices and higher interest rates. So if they've been on the fence, they're going to start going out and get and try to buy the houses today at, rather than trying to wait. Of course, that's making affordability uh, the big issue uh, that we're seeing. One of the other fallouts from the uh, pandemic effect has been de uh, delinquencies and foreclosures. It's it's you have to remember that, that everybody who went into the forbearance program, those loans were technically classified for measurement purposes as being delinquent. So it, it did balloon up the number, that's that 8.22. Uh, you can see how though, even with the problems that we've had, and, and, and incidentally, the pro number of properties that were in forbearance, I think topped out at about 10 million properties. And I think it, it's now down to uh, less than a million. So it's, it's in pretty good shape. The delinquency rate is being there. It's being worked over. The 90-day delinquency rate is still higher than we'd like to see, and we'll have to see how that's going to go. Uh, the 30-day delinquency rate, though, is some of these uh, forbearance and, and problems that people got laid off, lost their jobs, reduced income, so forth, and as the fiscal stimulus effects have given out, uh, that 30-day impact uh, has gone down. You can see it was nowhere near as big an impact as what we went through back in 2008, 9, 10 uh, in terms of delinquency, mortgage delinquencies, and so forth. Well, let me bring you to, here's what I think is going to happen in Texas. Uh, it looks like uh, home sales 
we, we think are going to slow down. The pace of home sales are going to slow down. I'm calling it at about 5%, but remember I did this projection probably about a month ago uh, at the beginning of the year. A lot of things have changed. We think we're getting past the COVID pandemic problem, but then we've run into the Ukrainian war problem. So, uh, and, and as prices and interest rates increase, it's going to, to take away some of the demand side. So we won't see sales quite as active. Hopefully uh, we'll see prices, they're still gonna probably be up double digit. I'm guessing around 12% for this year, uh, less than last year, but still anything in the double digit category is a significant price increase. And we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. But that's what it looks like. It looks like we'll set another record for sales. And incidentally, uh, this data includes new and used, uh, existing and new home sales uh, lumped together. Uh, here's our uh, best estimate. Single family construction permits are down a little bit here at the beginning of the year. This is an index and it's been seasonally adjusted and trend adjusted. Uh, quite frankly, we still see home construction this year as being quite active and quite strong. Uh, looking for probably uh, after 2020 being up 23% in 2021, uh, uh, which the final numbers aren't in for the construction data, but it was about 12% uh, increase. Looking for at least about a 10% increase. And, and look how the, the pattern has played out from the recovery from the 80s, which took 16 years. Well, we peaked out in 2005 when we had all the funny money and mortgage money available, and it took 16 years to 2021 uh, <laughs> to, to beat that prior peak. I don't think there's anything magical about 16 years. It's just more coincidence, I guess. But anyway, it takes a while in the market, and you can see what we're, we're projecting here for 2022 to be just shy of 200,000 units. And that goes back to that projection I showed you on the number of, uh, of households being created. Real quick, summary 2021, I don't think this is, is all that critically important, but you can see how the data were all up. Sales are up 6%. Total dollar volume, because prices increased so much, were up 25%. Average and medians up over you know 15 to 18%. Price per square foot, 168, almost 20% increase. That's a, that's a tremendous rate of increase. Uh, the new listings were only up one percent. So what are you going to do? It, it, you know, it's almost almost offset the sales completely, and a ninety eight point nine percent in the new home market. We had, uh, and this is again through the realtors through the MLS. We had almost sixty two thousand sales, which was actually down sixteen percent. And I think some of that was because builders in last year didn't have to build as many spec homes. You could contract out and sell the homes on contract basis without having to put them through uh, sales for the, from the realtors. Uh, total dollar buying, you can see the average and median prices were both up nearly 10% or a little better. Average price on the sales that we did have data for was about $171 a, a foot, uh, up almost 15%. What we're looking at today is months inventory of about 1.4 months. It's been, it's been almost 10 years since we were at the, even the five month level, that red box, which is my five to seven months of normal. Uh, and, and you can see we're just simply not getting there uh, anytime soon. Here's the sweet spots. I'm not, uh, this is telling you, I'm preaching to the choir now for those of you in the home building industry, you know it as well as I do, but between 200, 500,000, you know, two thirds of the sales are, are in that category. What's interesting is the half million dollar homes and, and above is up to 17% of the market. Traditionally or historically, that's been less than, 10, uh, less than 8% of the market. Uh, you can see the, the less than 100,000 is only 3% of the market. We're running out of lower priced homes and you can see that even the 100 to 200,000 is a really tough call. And they're just, uh, the, the month's inventory across the board in Aggie speak, we just ain't got none. Well, let me, let me, let me wrap this up. Obviously, the economy and everything that we're talking about is still subject to the pandemic effects. We, we're getting through that. I think really, we really are getting finally in two years over the pandemic effect, but it's still going to take probably all of this year to, to recover completely from just the pandemic. But then now we're, we've got to we've got to face the consequences and the impacts 
from the war in the Ukraine, uh, from tightening down, uh, spending tightening. We, we just don't know yet. Exports, we don't really export that much to Russia or to Ukraine, so that's not going to have a national impact. But the energy sector is going to get hit, and it's just not clear yet exactly what that impact is going to be or how heavy that impact is going to be. On the other hand, looking forward for the next year, really for the next several years, population is still going to continue to increase. Maybe at a little bit slower rate than what we had this last decade. The, the past decade was just, just phenomenal. But it is still going to increase. It's going to increase rapidly. And jobs are being created. Texas is a mecca now for job creation, which means mecca for people coming. Retail sector continues to improve and expand. Uh, a lot of that empty space that you may have seen in some of the shopping centers during the past year, year and a half, over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, it's going to start picking back up and filling up and people are going to come back. Uh, it, it, it just is inevitably going to happen. Housing is going to continue to be strong. We're still going to have short supply. There's nothing we there's no magic silver bullet there to get the supply automatically up. The only thing that's going to happen is maybe the demand is going to fall off a little bit uh, as as the pinup demand has been satisfied as interest rates increase. But back to the population, those millennial, the, the 29 to 35 year old group coming through is huge. And, and they are now entering the own market, the ownership market. So they are still going to be fueling demand. So the demand is not going to fall off as much as you might expect with the increase in the in the interest rates, unless they just go hog wild and go up, you know, to to unmentionable levels at this point. Uh, so it'll 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 be that way. The extended time and cost for home construction, I don't see that helping out much until or unless we can get uh, more people involved in the labor supply to increase the the uh, labor productivity. And, and the productivity is fine. It's just we don't have enough labor to be productive and also to to uh, loosen up the supply chain and the and the backlog and the orders and and have lumber and materials and steel and asphalt and cement and everything available appliances when they're needed uh, that that also should alleviate here during the next 12 to 18 months but for 2022 it's still going to be a major challenge energy is going to feed our economy in texas uh, it'll help houston particularly uh, dallas austin san antonio probably won't feel it all that much but it'll help there midland odessa will feel it uh, but but uh, we'll see how that works out it just won't be the same kind of oomph that we had historically back in the 60s and 70s and then and then later later on in the in the early part of this this century hotels restaurants uh other service businesses recovering and that again is going to take another 12 to, to 18 months well i appreciate your patience with me and uh, uh i think we still have at least a few minutes before one o'clock at least which was my cutoff time i think so if there's some questions, I'll be I'll be happy to try and answer whatever I can. Thank you. That was great, Dr. Gaines. Um, so we to be so have... fast. I had a lot. I'm sorry. I said I'm sorry to have to talk so fast, but I had a lot of stuff I wanted to say. Oh, it was fantastic. So we do only have time for a couple questions, but one of the first ones that we have is um, someone from Habitat Humanity asks. We are having a real problem building affordable low-income homes. Is there an outlook for material shortages and supplies to end? Well, and, and I appreciate that. And, and I've been trying to follow Habitat and, and, and other low-income housing uh, and affordable housing uh, providers and, and find out what they're doing and trying to do. The, the short answer to the question is not soon enough uh the the supply shortages and the the disruption in the supply chain it's not it's not only that that uh like appliances not getting manufactured quick enough because of the, they don't have the this the silicon chips all of the appliances are are now computers they're they're a refrigerator is nothing but a cold computer uh and and so it's not only that they're they're being slow in the manufacture, but we have the the bottlenecks in the supply chain in the distribution, the transportation, 
network. Um, items, anything that has to come in by ship is, is hitting ports. And, and if even if the ships get unloaded and the containers get unloaded, uh, there are not enough trucks uh, and truckers to move the, the cargo uh, containers uh, to the points where, where they're needed. Uh, we've got lumber shortages. If you recall in the last 20 years, uh, East Texas in particular, uh, uh, shut down a lot of sawmills, a lot of, uh, a lot of the lumber yards went out of business. Uh, a lot of the uh, forest uh, were, were not being harvested as they were in the past for lumber production. We import a great deal of the lumber that we use in the, in the United States and even in Texas from Canada. And of course, we put a tariff on that and that didn't help any uh, at all. Uh, so the short answer is, no, we don't see that in, in Habitat. I wish I could tell you something different. Uh, because what you do is great and we need, we need more of it. And we're, we're still trying to figure out how to do it better, better, bigger, and faster. Thank you. Do you mind putting the last chart back up, please? We have no a problem. Request. Chart or? Thank you. Button? Oh, chart. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. I think that was it. And um, we also had a couple questions. This recording will be emailed to everyone who registered. So that will include everything that Dr. Gaines said as well as his slides. So it'll be the recording. Um, so that'll be available. Um, right. We had another question. Do you think the world events will make the uh, Fed slow interest rate increases or even lessen the amount they would otherwise have been? Okay, I didn't follow you there completely. I, it was something about interest rates. Do you think the world events will make the Fed slow interest rate increases or even lessen the amount they would have been otherwise? Uh, I, I don't think it'll lessen. And in fact, the, 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 the concern now is that the Fed will act uh, faster uh, and, and do more than maybe they would have uh, without the, the Ukrainian issue. We knew that the Fed was probably going to be inter increasing interest rates simply because you can't have 7% inflation, as I showed you on one of the earlier charts here. And, and one of the few tools that the Fed has to fight high inflation is to, to cause interest rates uh, to go up. And so they are, they are doing that, they're, they're, it, and they are likely to be even a little bit more aggressive uh, with their increase in the interest rates, at least for the next uh, six to nine months. The, the real issue, the unknown here is, is how long this Ukrainian issue is going to last, this war, if you will, is going to last. And, and, and whether or not it will expand and, and be more than the, the, the limited conflict that it, it, it is, at least as of here at the noon hour on this date. We don't know if it's going to be expansive or not. So uh, I, I don't think that there's much chance that they'll slow down or lower, uh, lessen the interest rate increases. Okay. That's just my guess. For, I'm sorry. That's just my guess. Thank you. We probably have time for one more question. Sure. Um, considering the increase in homes needed, what are the municipalities doing to help home builders more closely meet their demand? Well, I don't know what they're doing specifically. What they can do is, of course, uh, help uh, first do no harm. Don't have regulations or regulatory controls or zoning ordinances or anything else that makes it more difficult or more expensive uh, to build new housing. The new housing has got to come. Uh, and, and so you don't want to be, be constrictive in, in some of the things that you do. One of, the, one of the issues facing the home builders today is land prices and, and lot inventory. Well, if you, if that's one of the reasons, not the only one, but it is one of the reasons we've seen the, the demand for new homes move out to the suburbs and exurbs where land is cheaper, uh, more easily obtained by developers and builders uh, and subject to less regulatory uh, impact, which keeps the cost down. So 
Uh, the other thing, and, and maybe back to the affordable housing issue, uh, the cities and the state and the feds uh, collectively government is going to have to be uh, more uh, inclusive and more helpful uh, in, in giving uh, uh, benefits and aids, whether it be tax credits or direct subsidies or absorption of some costs. If you want to build below market rent uh, uh, apartments, for example, uh, somebody's got to subsidize that and, and help that along. And the only, the only group that can really do that, there are some philanthropic groups that can do it, but, but really at any scale is going to be government. And I'm using government here uh, inclusive of at all levels. Great. Um, I think that's it for today. I don't think we have time for any more questions. I wanted to thank you again for that amazing presentation. And then I also wanted to thank Great American Insurance Group for making this webinar possible. And everyone, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.